Well, church, I want to say thank you um, for that this morning, and uh, uh, very humbled by uh, that vote, and um, I'm even more humbled that God would allow me to serve in this position in my hometown, which I just love. I mean, I love being here in Marion, and I love serving in this capacity. And also, on behalf of my kids, I want to say thank you, because their dad still has a job, uh, so he's able to feed them and take care of them as well. Uh, I was listening to uh, Pastor Alex share about the graduates and stuff, and I, and, uh, what, what did he say? Um, oh, I can't remember now, never mind, it was going to be funny, I think, but, you know, we'll forget about it at this point. So, I was going to sing a song, but I can't remember the words now, so. Um, anyways, uh, but just so proud of all the graduates and their accomplishments, and many of them I had in youth group as well. And just to see what God's molding them into is just incredible. And then uh, personal family members there as well. I also want to let you know that we have the results for um, our board members as well. And so the board members, the additional ones that we voted on this time were um, um, Bob Augenstein, Kevin Schreier, and Ken Stiverson. And then at our district conference this year, those who will be representing us are uh, Colleen Fiant, uh, Dr. Jonathan Friedley, and Kara Osborne. So they'll be going with us to the district. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 20. This is continuing our study on the idea of being revealed. And what I want you to remember is this, if you haven't been with us, one of the things we've been looking at is that Jesus was beaten. They saw him die on a cross. And then now his body is missing, and there's reports that he's beginning to spring up in different places, and people are be having contact with him. And he's showing up to some of the disciples, to uh, some of the other believers, the women. He's showing up to all kinds of different people. And so we wanted to take a look at the different times that he has revealed himself. We consider this Ascension Sunday as well. And then, of course, we have Memorial Day going on um, in the midst of all this, too. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know how you feel about things. But I kind of have a picture in my head what those last moments of my life will be like. I know, it's kind of scary. Uh, but I, I, I think of myself, you know, laying on the bed there, um, trying to, you know, say my last sort of words. I can see my five kids gathered around me and, you know, with that love and compassion that they may finally have for their dad, you know. And, uh, and they're leaning in, you know, almost to like, just can't wait for dad's last words, you know. And I wanted them to lean in real close with all that love and sincerity. And then I want to whisper to them, I spent your inheritance, you greedy little punks. You know? And, uh, <laughs> no, I, I really want them to come in, and I want to spend those moments saying, hey, guys, Dad loves you. And he's so proud of you, and he can't believe what you've accomplished and the things that you're going to continue to do in life. And these are the last words of basically Jesus here on earth before he ascends into heaven. And so Matthew has been writing a story of Jesus and purpose of trying to minister to the Jews out there that this is in fact the Messiah and then here are the final words that met of great importance then to Matthew and this is what he records so I'm going to read together with you in Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20 it says this then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go when they saw him they worshiped him but some doubted then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray together. Father, um, I pray today that... Uh, that as we look at some of the final words that you made and some of the final comments you gave, I pray that we, like the disciples, would be challenged with those words that you gave and that it would move us to make a difference in our surroundings and the world around us. We pause for a moment today, Father, as we recognize that this is traditionally a week that we celebrate Memorial Day. We think about those ones who have served our country who have died in the line of battle. We think about those students in the schools whose lives have been taken. We think about those family members who we have lost along the way. We think even today for Steve Parcell who called this morning and said his father Dick had passed away. 
Father, these are moments that we pause to remember those who have sacrificed so much for us. Tomorrow's a day when we get together with family and friends and we do a lot of celebrating, but there are others that will go to a tombstone and they will put a flag or a flower or some sort of keepsake just showing that love that they have for that individual who is no longer with them here on this earth. Father, in these moments like this, I pray that we'd recognize a God who died and rose again and gives us the ability to do so as well. I ask today that if there's anything that I would say that it is incorrect, I pray, Lord, that you would correct things so that when we hear it, it would be what you would want to say to us and not me. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we look at a passage of scripture like this, and I think all of us sort of know the title of this. We call this the Great Commission, which is basically the idea that we are co-doing something with God. So there's a mission that God is doing and that he has called us to be a part of. So together we're in it. But one of the struggles that we have and is in a message like this, we, we look at this passage and we realize that it might be a passage on evangelism. And we say, well, this message was just for the disciples because right away it says and the 11 disciples had gathered now we know that there were 12 disciples but the one had taken his life because uh judas had felt like you know because he knew that he betrayed jesus felt a lot of guilt about that so he'd taken his life and now the 11 are called to this specific time and if you think that this message is just to the disciples i want to tell you you're correct it is to the disciples the question is what is a disciple a disciple is a follower. A disciple is one who listens to someone that is teaching and they begin to mimic some of the things that they're talking about. So if you and I were to share with one another, we would probably have people in life where we would say, I never thought about it, but this was somebody that I would listen to and I would try to mimic and I became a follower of them. And if they would ask this question, I would probably say that I was a disciple of them. I remember early growing up and in the sixth grade and just recently my sixth grade teacher passed away, Mr. Fairchild, and it brought just a lot of good memories because he was just this fun teacher who made things exciting. And I remember in those moments thinking, boy, I'd love to be a teacher that's fun like that and kind of messes with kids but teaches them at the same time. I would love to be like that. And I thought of myself like I might be a disciple of Mr. Fairchild. I had another um, guy that was a coach and his name was Mr. Cockrell, and he was our football coach in middle school, but he was also the accounting teacher, and I love this accounting stuff, and he made football fun and, and exciting. We won a lot of games, but he also made, if you can imagine this, he made accounting fun, which is really hard to do, by the way, but he just made that exciting, and I remember thinking to myself, man, I would love to be a disciple of his, and I, I would love to take something that is so boring and just make it exciting and where kids want to come to class. I remember going into college and I always had this problem where I loved being in sports because that just I felt like that showed my manly side and then I had this side that really loved music but I was like man I want to look like a sissy you know so I struggled with sort of that balance at times like how do you do the sports and how do you do the music and because there were just connotations with that at the time and I remember going to college and we had this, this choir director and we affectionately called him prof, but he became a doctor and it was Dr. Todd Guy. And the way that he would lead the music from the stage was just this intensity and, and he would bring out the best in people. But many of you weren't in our practices. But I'm telling you, man, he was like a football coach. I remember he would get so intense some days and be so frustrated with us because he felt like we were just going through the motions that he would take this stand and he would slam it and he would throw it across the room. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, this is a Christian university. And then he would make these powerful statements. He would be like, man, I'm glad Christ didn't give half on the cross for you. And I'd be like, oh. That was just gut-wrenching. And I, and I loved it because it just felt like I was on, it was like, music is tough. You know, like, we're really going to get in this and producing this great sound. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I want to be a disciple of Dr. Guy. And I want to lead choirs and stuff as well. But then I realized I wasn't very good at singing, so that one just faded by, you know? And then I remember my grandpa. And my grandpa was one of these guys that we get for. He was a, he was a, he was a great uh, superintendent here at the, uh, the church for Sunday school. He was a, uh, a, um, a principal at school. 
And Grandpa had this sort of authority that he would have, but he also had this great spirit about him that was just so soft as well. And man, every one of his, his, his grandkids and great-grandkids are like, man, I want to be like him. I want to be like him. But I have to tell you, there's, there, there's nobody else that I want to be more like than Jesus. Jesus is the one that I want to be a follower of. Jesus is the one that I want to be a disciple of. And so I ask you this question, church. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, then what he says here is important to us. What he says here is not just for the 11 disciples of that day, but it's for us as disciples. If you are a disciple, then Jesus gives us the mission and not a suggestion. And I say that for this reason, because I think that there's a lot of things that we sort of suggest in life. Like my wife's really good at this. She'll say, um, you think we should mow the lawn? <laughs> She'll say stuff like, do you, you think we should clean up? Do um, you think we should talk to the kids? You know, she's got all these suggestions, but I know that they're not suggestions. I know that they are commands, and that if I don't do them, there will be wrath to pay, you know? Like, I get that. And Jesus is not necessarily giving us suggestion as much as he's giving us a mission. Like, if you are a follower of me, then here is the mission that I'm going to give you. And so as I was reading this passage, and I never thought about this first part before at all, but I want to give you this to start off with. I believe there's four moments of awe that we need to take into consideration before we get in this passage. So for example, in verse 18, if you read this with me, it says, then Jesus came to them and said what? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Then in verse 19, he says, therefore go and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of, of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 20, he says, and teaching them to obey everything not just but sort of all things i have commanded you and he says and surely i am with you always to the very end of the age these four moments of all that we read about the first one is that he has been given all authority here in heaven and on earth and this is really what he's been talking about his whole ministry and this is something the disciples began to figure out that jesus was all human and that he suffered exactly like a human. He went through all the things that we have. He began to have that authority on earth, but he was also fully God. In other words, the authority that he comes with is that of the creator who was speaking to the creation. And here are the thoughts and the minds and the, and the things I want to give to you. And it is in his power and his authority that we were able to do so many things that Jesus was fully God. Secondly, he began to talk about that I want you to make disciples of all nations. And what I love about this is because there for a period of time, we basically thought that the good news or the gospel was basically only for the Jews. But this is Jesus' way of saying that this message isn't just for the Jews, but this message is for all nations for every single person in all time and all period. That means it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what your economic background is. It doesn't matter the sin and the past and the shame that you have in your life. This message is for every single person here. And I have to tell you, if I was the one who was writing that, and if I was the one who was determining who the good news or the gospel was for, there are many people that I might leave out. I might leave people out just because they looked at me wrong that day. And I said, you know, I didn't like that. I might leave my kids out of time for the tone that they presented that morning. There are people that would walk in that would be dressed differently than I. They could wear something from Michigan, and I'd be like, no, no, I'm not getting in, because I don't want to see any of that stuff up there, you know? Like, we could write people off. We could write people off because they are different than us. We could write people off because they have too much or they don't have enough. 
And what Jesus says is, this message is for all people at all times. And I love that because that means there is hope for every single person in this world. Every single person who steps through the doors of our church, there is hope for you. Because the good news of Jesus Christ is for all people at all times. Thirdly is this, is that he says, everything I have commanded you, or all the commands. And what I want us to recognize is that when Jesus came to this earth and he left heaven above, he came there and he began to give us commands that were important to us. And you and I have to understand that his commands, every single one of his commands are important to us. Now I have to tell you, I may not get all the commands right all the time, but they are still important to me. There are ways that I should live my life. There are ways that I should govern myself. It's sort of the mark that I should have that I would say, Chuck, how are you stacking up against this today? And not that it weighs me down, it's just a way to get better. Like, you know what, maybe you shouldn't respond to that way. You remember Jesus' commands or his teachings. Maybe you could have done this differently. And so we wrestle with that at all times, knowing that his commands are important. And then I'm glad and thankful for this final one in verse 20. And it says, always, always I am with you. Jesus is always with us. He will never leave us. And I think that some of you need to hear that. Because there have been times in your life when you've been abandoned. You may have been abandoned by a spouse. You may have been abandoned by a parent. You may have been abandoned by a child. You may have been abandoned by coworkers. You may have been kicked off teams or groups or something that has just messed with your life. There may be even times in your life when you felt like you've been abandoned by God. But God's promise is this. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So he gives us this, and then he calls us into the mission part. And again, that's the co-mission, where God is doing a part and we are doing a part as well. Now, for some of you, you might start to turn me out right here because you'll be thinking, man, this whole message is going to be about evangelism. And you'll start to think, man, there's no way because God's going to call me to evangelize somebody that I just don't want to. It's going to be like that one person that you really can't say, like, man, he's going to ask me to go to that person. Or for some of you, you're going to be like, he's going to call me in another country. I know it. I got to take my family. We got to move somewhere. We're going to Africa. Who knows? It's always Africa, by the way. You never notice that? That's where we send people. We're always going to send people somewhere, right? And so for some of us, we start to tune this out a little bit. But before you tune me out, first of all, I want you to know that evangelism doesn't necessarily have to be hard. And it doesn't always have to be about sending us to some remote place. The other thing about evangelism that I want you to understand is that for some of you, you're afraid to evangelize or you're afraid to tell people about Christ because you're afraid they're going to say what to you? No. You're going to be afraid that they're going to stop talking to you. They're going to tune you out. Here's what I want you to know. This is not a battle for you to win or lose. This is the Lord's battle. At the end of the day, God's not going to be like, well, Chuck, <laughs> mess that one up. Here's a bad check mark. Because it's not my battle to win or lose. It's the Lord's battle. As a matter of fact, if you look at that passage of Scripture, even before he goes into this mission, he says the word therefore. And the word therefore is a moment for you and I to go, hey, like, let's stop a minute and sort of read what that's about. And he says, all authority has been given to who? To him. His is the battle to win or lose. It's not ours to win or lose. But because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, then he says, then I want you to go. And I have to tell you something. There's something powerful about going in the name of Jesus. There's something powerful about going in his steps. It says, man, some of them doubted along the way. And doubt, man, is really a response to fear. And there are so many times that we're afraid to go in a situation, and God says, I will be with you always. I am there in the midst. I am giving you the power. I am calling you to evangelize. And you and I have to just be faithful. So he says, therefore, go. And I want you to know that the word go in Greek is poriero, 
which if you know what that word means, and it almost sounds like pour at the beginning, and maybe you can think of it this way, but this is the idea of maybe pouring into other individuals. Matter of fact, the word go is not just so singular as we see it, but it's the word going. And if you look at the word going, it has a little bit more weight to it. It means while you're on the way, here's the things to do. Or maybe some of you could even consider it this way. While you're doing life, here's the things that I want you to think about. And so you and I have to think about then what is our mission field? Like where are we going? Who are the people that we are around? Some of you, you're going to be on the way with your coworkers. Some of you are going to be on the way with your family. I don't know what that specific place is. I know what it is for me. I know my going is with my five kids. I know that that's who I'm doing life with. And so when I look at this passage, and when you look at this passage, I want you to think in those terms, like, who am I doing life with? Because this is what it applies to. So Jesus says, therefore, go. And while you're doing life, in verse 19, he says, make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Now, we already said a disciple is what? Somebody who follows the teacher. And what I want you to understand, and if I would just give you my scenario, I have to understand this, that my kids see me as dad preaching, and then they see me as dad at home. And they're watching me to see how I respond to situations in life. And one of the things that I have to do as dad and as preacher is I have to get them to understand, don't follow dad so much as you follow Jesus. Because dad's going to mess up a lot. But Jesus never fails. But there is still a weight in that, isn't there? Because the kids can say, well, Dad, if you love Jesus, don't you think then that you'll follow him and you'll start to mimic him and start to act like him? Yeah, that should be my goal. But I should point people and my kids to Jesus. So when I come in certain situations and I'm doing life with my kids, I need to point them to Jesus. So when something goes wrong, something health-wise, or the car breaks down, or we're not having as much money, the kids need to watch to see how I'm doing life and how I'm showing them Jesus. And there have been many moments that we just need to stop and pray as a family, asking God to intervene in this situation. Why? Because kids, Dad can't do this on his own. But I can do a lot more through Christ who gives me strength. Kids, I can't handle the death that we've just experienced. But man, I have a Savior who can help me handle this, and let's go to Him. There have to be times when my kids see compassion from me and grace. There have to be times when my kids see that I hold my tongue. I mean, I don't know how many sporting games I've been to of theirs, and man, do I so badly want to yell something. <laughs> oh, man. You know? I lo- that's why I wa- love watching Ohio State at home, because it's just me and the TV. No one else has to hear it. You know? I mean, you'd be like, this guy's a lunatic if you heard me sometimes. But at those school events, there's many times that I want to say something so bad and I'm biting my tongue, and luckily somebody else says what I'm thinking. And I can just be like, man, they look like an idiot. <laughs> and I can just be okay with it. But they don't have to worry about dad embarrassing them in those situations. Why? Because I'm trying to show them how I handle things. There are times when people say hateful and mean things to me. And maybe they say it to my kids as well. And I have to show them that I'm not going to stoop to that level. But as I follow Jesus, I'm going to pray for those who have a problem with me. For those who may persecute me in some way, I'm going to lift them up. Instead of looking for the bad in people, I'm going to look for the good in people. And I'm making them disciples that way. I would love to tell you to get those right every time, but I don't. And that's why it's important for me as I'm making disciples to don't follow Dad as much as you follow Jesus. His dad's going to fail along the way. Secondly, as we're doing life with with, uh, people, in verse 19 it says this, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Church, I have to tell you, last week was just a great week. (laughs) And And I missed the whole thing that day. And the reason why I missed it is we had so many moving parts of the service that I didn't get to quite hear everything that was going on or didn't get to experience it. It was like, okay, we got to take a new members. You got to preach. 
you got to do the baptism and you got to do the teen skit and so all these things are going through matter of fact when i was baptizing my own daughter which was a special moment for me i heard everybody laugh and she gave her testimony i had no idea why they were laughing and so i went and listened to the service afterwards and i was like man it was a that was a powerful powerful time and i loved hearing my daughter's testimony because she basically said well you know i love jesus and i try to do good things and well, and then she goes well at school you know, basically not at home. I think she thought we were going to rat her out on that one, you know. And I thought it was a great moment. But then I heard uh, uh, different testimonies. And, man, it was a privilege for me in first service to baptize Dorothy Fling, and who's been in the church uh, since my youth. I've got to do that. And then I heard uh, Jerry's testimony. And the intensity in that moment and the things that he shared and the things that he went through with that, with that kid. And to know what he turned to and know that when he gave it all over to God that that began to make a new creation in him. And that, that was a powerful moment. And the reason why baptism is so important because it's that moment that I love, and this is my favorite line when we say it, but we say you, you're, you're dying to sin and then you're coming out alive in Christ. Because Christ took our sins when he died and he took them to hell. And then he rose again, proving that you and I can have victory over our sin as well. And there's something powerful in that. But the other thing you may not know about baptism is, baptism was a way for the early church to say that you belong. It's the part of being included. And so there's an inclusion that happens in baptism where we say that you're, you're part of us, and you're saying that I want to be part of this group. Because we recognize that alone we can't do all things, but when we come together as a body, there is so much more that we can do. And when I'm doing life with my kids, what I need to do is show them the value of the church, show them the value of small groups, show them the value of being around other believers, that this is a great group you want to be a part of. Not because we get everything right, but because when we do things wrong, that we can challenge one another to grow in our faith that we can start having these moments where iron sharpens iron, that we can get involved in small groups. Because listen, this kind of stuff is not going to happen in the big setting. But there will be moments of time when you and I need to be in small groups where we can confess our sins to one another. We, we can be challenged by the word together. Where we can figure out how do we live this life out. And then there are times that we just need to pray for one another. And just to lift each other up. And that can't necessarily happen in a big setting like this. And that's why it's good to belong to a body that we can be a part of and we can be included in. You see, there's so many other things that you have to have membership in order to really be included. And membership for here is just a way to vote, really. What we really care about is people who are just coming and getting the work done and being part of this group and loving it. And we're loving others. That's what it's all about. And so while you're doing life, make sure people feel included, like they belong to the body of Christ. Even if they don't step the foot in these doors and they may go to another church, they're still part of the body of Christ. Thirdly is this, teach them to obey. It says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I have to tell you, like, it's one thing to teach and it's another thing to obey. But he says, here's all the commands I've given you, and I want you to follow these things. And we know that the commands that he gives us, he tells us to love God with everything that we can, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We like the ones like don't murder, because most of us don't struggle with those type of issues. But then there's some other things when we get into gossip and slander, and we're like, ah, oh, he's cutting me here now. But he says, look, I want you to obey all these commands. And you and I have to find the value in doing that, don't we? We have to recognize that all authority has been given to Jesus, so therefore we will obey his commands. You see, um, as a parent, and some of your parents will know this, but um, man, there are times when you're like, you're trying to teach your kids things because it's for their good. You know, like I, I'll say stuff like, man, you know, it'd be a good idea if you would clean your room. And they're looking like, at you like, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. And I'm thinking, well, you don't want stuff to grow in there. You don't want it to be smelly and stuff, right? I'll try to teach them things like, you know, it's probably a good idea to brush your teeth. Probably a good idea for you to take a shower, put some deodorant on. Where the kids might think, I don't know, man, dad's kind of stupid on that stuff. I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, well, I, I really would like it if people could be around you and not smell you. You know, I think that would be a good idea. You know, but there could be something where they say, well, I don't want to follow him. He's so stupid and he's so old. What does he know about this smelling good stuff? He stinks, you know? But I want you to know this is that there's a part of us that is so kid-like sometimes. 
And you and I have to understand that God is giving us these commands for our betterment. Not to hold us down. He's trying to pour into us and say, here's a better way to live. And you and I can write them off like, God, what do you really know? But he's the creator. He's the one who has all authority. And I think what you and I struggle with, which many kids struggle with, is this idea of surrender. Do I really have to listen to them? Yeah, it's really a good idea to listen to God. It's really a good idea to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's really a good idea to follow Jesus' teachings. It's a good idea. You see, because surrender is this. It's about surrendering your wants to his desires. And there's a lot of wants that I want in life. There's a lot of things that I would do very poorly and stupidly. But we need to be surrendered to Jesus for the betterment of the kingdom. And so while I'm doing life, there are certain things that I need to surrender. I need to surrender my will to his will. There are times that I need to surrender my finances because God wants to do something else with them. There are some times I need to surrender my time because God wants to do something with them. You know, even last night, I got done doing a wedding, went to as many graduations as I could. I couldn't even get to my own families. And then I got a call last night from Steve Parcell. He said, uh, my dad's on hospice. Would you come and visit him? And uh, I didn't have to wrestle with that very much, but there could be a part of me that would say, like, man, I've been working all day, Lord. One more thing tonight. But you just realize you just got to go. Because God opened up an opportunity, went and prayed, and then he passed away this morning. Man, I'm so glad that I surrender my will to his will because it allows us to get more things accomplished. And so there's something about surrendering to his will that is significant. So the question is for you here as we end. Where's your mission filled? I can't answer that for you, but where's your mission filled? I know what it is for me. My mission filled is my family. My mission filled is the staff. And my mission field is this church. Because I want to lead in such a way that we bring glory and honor to his name and not mine. And I want to keep pointing people to follow Jesus instead of anything else.